comes to life. Uh, we were talking with Rubini De Silva. Uh, you might have read some of Rubini's recent work on Good for Your Hunting Vine Pair. Uh, she is also a longtime blogger. You might have seen her work elsewhere on Porch Drinking, Craft Beer Austin, and others. Uh, Rubini also an excellent advocate on behalf of diversity, equity, and inclusion in beer. Um, we're going to talk about a few stories, the reporting that went on behind them, uh, and what we can learn to take away ourselves. So, Rumini, thank you very much uh, for joining and being a part of this conversation tonight. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me, Brian. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here. And, yep, sorry, I'm not the Beer and Racism authors, but hopefully we'll have a really interesting um, chat about ideas around um, identity, culture, diversity, inclusion, um, and, yep, why, why these are all really important. Yeah, and if you haven't read some of her recent work, uh, links were in the Google invite that went out. So whether you have and want to catch up afterward or get interested in reading more about these stories after we talk about them, uh, they will be both in that Google invite as well as the newsletter from the Guild that goes out later this week. Um, I want to start with kind of the, I guess, the high level important question. Uh, because as so much of our reporting over the last couple of years has rightfully focused more so on storytelling of uh, stories and people that were often overlooked or underrepresented both in, in beer and the world around beer, um, we are focusing more time on this idea of covering culture, identity, and how these things come to play within the beverage alcohol industry. So, you know, for the time that you spent both as an advocate and a writer, uh, Ruvini, why is it that it's important to write about these kinds of topics? Um, I think that as we've um, seen particularly recently with the huge sexism scandals that have rocked um, the beer industry on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, if we are not talking um, and discussing about issues of diversity and identity, then we are not acknowledging any problems that are going on. And also we are, um, we're not promoting the idea that representation um, and genuine inclusion is really, really important. So I think that as writers within the industry, telling those stories and also sort of acting as a, a, a representative, a minority representative is incredibly important to ensure that we're you know, the full picture of the different people's experiences of working and being in the beer industry is being told. For as someone who's thought about this aspect of storytelling for a while, I am curious how the past three weeks or so has maybe impacted both looking back on stories you've told uh, and things that you're thinking about and reporting and how that's maybe changing your mind a little bit, as well as a lot of these stories kind of come to front. For those who are not familiar, um, we are talking about um, the thousands of stories uh, that were brought to life first by Brian Allen, Brewer at Knox Brewing, Massachusetts, and then by others. Um, highlighting uh, incidents of sexual harassment, assaults, and decent behavior uh, runs the whole gamut. Um, and so, Ruvini, that was something that you had mentioned as kind of, we've just recently had this additional kind of inflection point. Uh, how is this and what's happened most recently maybe impacted the way that you actively think about these things in real time? Um, I think that that is a very, very pertinent question because I think that as a beer writer, in many ways, myself and and many other beer writers and people who are not sort of frontline industry, we can be quite insulated from a lot of the um, the harshest behaviours that go on inside the industry. I mean, more as a beer drinker would be my experiences of, of the worst side of what I've seen in the industry. But at the same time, as, you know, as a woman, as a woman of color, and as a woman of color who's worked in creative industries uh, for my entire career, um, I wasn't surprised 
what I was really shocked about was the culture of cover-ups and persistent, consistent refusal to acknowledge and then to penalize victims that has been going on. And that has included women as well as men. Um, that was really the, the biggest shock for me was just how all these stories had managed to go unreported. And I think that to go back to your first question, this is why ongoing constant vigilance from writers, from reporters and from industry observers um, and giving people the space to tell their stories and voice their experiences is absolutely crucial. And to, to go back to that idea again of why it's important to tell stories of identity, I think we're, we're talking about maybe broadly here as well, but from your own personal perspective, why is this a space that you find important and ripe for storytelling? Um, if we don't talk about identity, different identities and our own identities and experiences, it, it's hard to create um, an atmosphere of empathy. And I think that for a lot of people, they may not have the idea and understanding. A lot of men may not understand what it's like for a woman in beer. A lot of white people may not understand what it's like for a person of color. And if we don't talk about those identities and how they affect our relationship to the industry, how the perceptions of our reception and um, the work that we do and ev everything that comes into all of those elements of being in the beer world, from the perspective of our identity, then it's much harder to, uh, to get that understanding shared and to build a sense of empathy between people um, from different groups and different viewpoints. Well, you have a great example of this, <laughs> as luck would have it. Um, this is a story that you wrote for Good Beer Hunting uh, that was published earlier this year. Uh, it is titled A Rare Gem or a Llama in a Suit, um, in which you kind of you work to bridge this gap, uh, both from a reporting standpoint and one in which you are sharing your own stories uh, and your own experiences. Um, before we jump into talking about this story a little bit, could you maybe share with people how the impetus for this one came to be? Um, absolutely. As a South Asian woman um, who sort of is, is in the beer world, at that time, I was just sort of crossing over professionally into beer writing. Um, I hadn't really considered how unusual my position was. And it was really when the pandemic first hit and, and I was at home and I was sort of thinking, you know, I have these amazing beer friends, I'm part of this amazing community, but oh, wh wh where, where are the other South Asian women? Oh, you know, have I not made enough of an effort? Am I not in the right place? And then I began looking for them and realized that it, 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 it was a real, a genuine absence. And I wanted to know why. And there were a lot of obvious answers which um, come from you know, being a South Asian, understanding that culture. But the, that, the sheer dearth was, uh, was, was quite shocking to me. And as I put in the article, I may not have seen it initially. I grew up in a very, very white environment. I was very used to being the only brown person. But once I did see it, I couldn't unsee it. And I, I was determined to find other South Asian women who were um, into beer, involved in beer, passionate about beer, and, and find out if, if we did have those commonalities and um, a shared story to tell, and, and we did. And it became very clear very quickly that we did. Yeah, let's talk about that because one of the things I found was very interesting. So I'm here on Instagram. Uh, this is the hashtag South Asian Beer Lady of which you reference uh, and link to in the article. So we do we do see photos of you here. Um, but in the piece, you also mention it in, a, you know, very specific ways that this ended up being kind of a connective tissue for you to find others. Um, so in exploring the potential for finding sources and finding other South Asian beer ladies, um, could you maybe share with us a little bit about how you kind of went through the behind the scenes work of finding other people on social media and then setting up and getting those interviews? 
Yes, absolutely. Um, so South Asian beer lady, um, I I took on as as or sort of as my hashtag. But when I was looking for people, I tried every permutation of woman, brown, beer, South Asian, Asian, <laughs> lady, girl. Yeah, I, I I tried absolutely everything. Um, and my initial breakthrough was actually with Brown Beer Babe. Um, and the amazing Brown Beer Babe, who I found, Amrita Kovac. She is um actually based in Canada. Um, and we had a really, really good initial chat and she was able to, because she's been on Instagram a lot longer than me, uh, point me in the direction of um, a couple of other South Asian women who were into beer who she had come across. And then they, in turn, were able to point me in the direction of others. And through that, um, I, I met a grand total of four South Asian women who um, were into beer, but um, I, and were all fortunately very, very willing um, to talk to me, to share their stories, um, and to discuss um, our identity, our place in the industry. But it really, really was, it, was, it wasn't easy. So um, that was one of the um, the reasons that I initially set up my South Asian Beer Club account, just because I thought there should be one place where South Asians could go to be to, to find each other. And while it's it's you know it's not sort of taken off in a huge way, um, it, it is great because it it does give me a reference point um, of looking for if I want to find someone else um, to give an opinion, um, to find out what beers they're brewing, what their influences are, uh, what's going on in, you know, particularly in the Indian beer market. Um, I've got uh, somewhere that I can go and I hope that that's the same for, um, for other people. But in terms of actually sourcing the women who I spoke to in the article, yes, it was hard. It was hard, but it was amazing in terms of um, the way that we were able to interact and share our stories and the commonalities that we had. There was a, to your point exactly, there was this great quote that you got from uh, Amrita, who, who is brown uh, beer girl, uh, I'm sorry, a brown brew babe on Instagram. Who are you just talking about? She said to you, I didn't realize how much I had to say about all this, uh, about this idea of finding uh, commonalities and people like her as well. So in, I guess, trying to reach that realization, we started off with you just trying to find people to talk to, to then people realizing, wow, I maybe never had this opportunity to do this in the first place. Was there something there in terms of just, you know, reaching out and telling them about what you were working on to get them to kind of open up like that? Yes, very much. Um, I think that being approached by another South Asian beer lady um, definitely um, created a space for a very, very open dialogue. And I also think that you know, sharing the, the parts of my story and the questions that I chose to ask um, enabled um, a very, very honest and very um, open discussion with each of them. And also sort of you know, all of us connecting together across social media. Um, and you know, we're all um, friends of Instagram. We all support each other's posts. We, we, we all follow what, what the other one is up to and having sort of all read each other's and seen each other's stories and how they much they reflect um, our own experiences um, has been something that I've never experienced before and I don't think um, any of them have either which uh, which is pretty special I think. Maybe to share some of the behind the scenes work there too because we so often talk about the first finding sources but then just convincing them, hey, you're, it's worth sharing your time with me so I can hear you, listen to you, and share your story. In that initial process of trying to contact them, maybe sharing some of your experience and working to get them to, one, say okay, and then two, open up, how did you go about that? How was it that you helped to make that initial connection, maybe where, whether it was sharing your own story, your interest in telling their story, how did all that come to life? Um, I think it was a mix of yeah of both of those things. I think the very fact that I was writing an article, that I was researching an article on South Asian women in beer, you know, it was sort of shocking and exciting at the same time, because it's not it wasn't something that any, any of them ever thought would happen. It wasn't something for a long time that I was sure you know, I, I could definitely get other people interested in, but. For all of us, it was something that we were very, very passionate about telling and just the very concept of a story about 
know, what we were doing and our, our very specific experiences. And in the article, um, you'll say that there are very, very specific experiences um, to, relating to our families, relating to what happens when we go to a tap room, what, how people approach us. Um, that somebody was actually uh, wanted to, to share that and put that out there. I mean, I think that that was uh, that was a very that was a very very uh, a draw to get to get people to um to open up. And I think it was quite different from when I um approached the um the brewers whom I read about for Vine Pair because I think that for them they were like, there there are other sap there are other um Asian Indian brewers some of them and so well, oh this is again this this is the story but. They were a bit more sort of reticent with me because, you know, I'm not an Asian Indian brewer. I'm not an Asian Indian male. And, you know, I don't own or run a brewery. So for them, it was I'm coming in as an outsider. Whereas, you know, when I spoke to the um, amazing women for Good Bear Hunting, I was coming to them already as an insider. If that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. And just just to maybe tie these things together is that what I hear you saying is that it was easier to have comp to first set up conversations and having conversations with other women of South Asian descent. Whereas when you tried to reach out to uh, industry professionals who were men, they were far more uh, hesitant to strike up that conversation. Um, I wouldn't say that exactly. I would say that when I was approaching the women um, for that particular story, I was very much coming to them as one of them. Whereas when I approached the men for the Vine Pair story, the um, Asian Indian brewers, I was coming to them as a professional writer. Does that make sense? It does. It it's does. a very, very different approach. And it, it, it leads me to maybe ask uh, a perhaps naive and uh, maybe a little ignorant question on my behalf, because both of those scenarios in which I am a straight white man, uh, of which I do not have uh, those, those similar backgrounds. And so I am curious because we also have other uh, white writers on this call, that is this a scenario where being able to have, have those kinds of cultural or connective tissues, it sounds like that was something of a grounding point in those conversations. And I'm curious if there's a, a way that as a reporter in which, you know, I'm always trying to find and connect with new sources, if there's a responsible way for me to consider what that means for me. Um, I think that because a lot of my writing does come from a very personal place. Um, you know, I'm not a reporter. I don't cover sort of breaking news stories. Um, I very much write about uh, features, things that I can connect with in some way. That's a very different experience. It's a very different type of writing to um, to sort of a much more clear and um, precise uh, news reportage. But I will say that certainly um, when I approached um, the um, Asian Indian brewers, when we well, again, again rounding them up was not easy. <laughs> um, that also required a fair bit of research to just to find five, and that was you know that that was a journey again in itself. Um, and sort of saying to them, okay, you don't know me, you don't know anything about me, but I want to tell your story. Um, I don't, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that that initial conversation would be that different to a conversation that you would have. Although I would say that once I started talking to them and then we sort of discussed our own experiences and then uh, we were very much more on familiar ground, uh, uh, talk, talk, talking very much, you know, about, about South Asian families and expectations and how we grew up. But that initial approach, I would say it's very much you know, I, I'm interested in you. I want to tell your story from your point of view. And I think that that's really, um, it's that, again, to go back to what we were saying earlier, it's that sense of empathy, that sense of sharing and wanting to understand someone else's identity that, um, that I've found to be most important in these stories. Uh, I'm going to jump back and forth between these two stories now, but I do want to highlight, this is the story for Vine Pair that you wrote. Um, the five Asian Indian craft beer pioneers in North America to watch. Um, those were the brewers you were just talking about. Um, but one of the things that you, you had just mentioned uh, really struck me about the piece for Good Beer Hunting because it did dive so far into personal storytelling, both for yourself and others, is that your sources in the story, as well as I, I believe you did too, 
a kind of shared that your love for beer is something that was not shared with other people close in your family uh, because of the cultural so uh, side of things um, and what that would mean potentially for those relationships too. And again, like this comes to one of those really important pieces of reporting. Uh, I'm not gonna let you get off the hook of saying you're not a reporter because you did do reporting here uh, and good reporting. And so when we try to get into those, you know, get those meaningful connections that can take place only in you know, this 30 minute span or whatever it is that we have with people, what did it take to get people to open up in this way to you to talk about their love for beer, which they wouldn't talk about with their family, to get them to that point where they felt comfortable in talking in that kind of candid way? Um, I think that seeing me doing exactly the same thing um, was definitely um, helpful because they immediately knew that I was an ally and that I had you know, some similar experiences and also um, a similar passion for, uh, for the same things that they did. And then as we began, um, it was, I think, a series of three different, um, most of the conversations I had were over email. I think it was a series of three different sets of, of questions that I, I posed to them. And over time, like the first the first set, yeah, it, I got very short answers. Um, it was, they were, they were sort of, um, they were more nervous and more hesitant, but as we corresponded back and forth, talking about um, our own experiences, um, it was easier to build up that um, that trust and also um, to to express the similarities that that we'd um, all been through, which were, I mean, so striking, so very, very striking, much more than than I think any of us ha had expected, because as um, I said in the article, you know, geographically, we're from incredibly different places. <laughs> Um, and it was, yeah, it was really, really quite, quite eye opening to see how similar in such, such different worlds our experiences could be. And uh, just for context, too, this is a quote from uh, Sarah Nadim, who in the story, I believe, uh, references her Pakistani culture. She says, quote, I believe the only member of my family who knows about my love for craft beer is my younger brother. No one else knows because I know they would never approve of it or would look at me weird, end quote. And just to kind of like give that example for everybody of that personal side of things um, that uh, Rubini was able to get uh, out of people in, in, that, in that reporting. Um, I'm going to ask you one more question about reporting. Let's jump back over to the Vine Pair store real quick, but I will give a heads up if anybody else has questions to ask. You are more than welcome to uh, type it in the chat box for everyone. Uh, if you want to ask it uh, anonymously, I am happy to do that for you. You can just direct message it to me, uh, or I will pause after this uh, and ask if you would like to chime up and ask the question directly as well. Um, we'll do that in just a moment, um, but let's get back to uh, this story. Uh, Ruben, you had mentioned the difficulty of finding people uh, for this story and for the industry professionals, um, so we've got people all over the map, literally. Uh, we've got Connecticut, and we've got Chicago in here, we've got Dallas, um, Canada is represented as well. Um, there was a note that I wrote down when I was, I was reading this story that was simply, how did she find all these people? Um, and I think you, you hinted at some of the, the, the challenge of telling a story like this. How did you find all these people? Again, it was literally crawling through social media. Um, there were a few um, people who, I mean, okay, the only person who actively reached out to me, but who I had sort of found as well was um, Ravi Patel at Other Desi. Um, we, we had sort of mutually connected before this story and I actually, he was the impetus for me thinking this would be a great story if I could find enough other Asian Indian growers. So I thought I'm, I'm gonna find them, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start looking. And it was, it was quite, it was quite a challenge. Um, Azadi, um, I came across, they do, a, I mean, they're quite active on social media. So I found them relatively easily uh, between them and other Desi and um, they both sort of le led me towards um, merit. 1947, I'm actually drinking their beer um, right now. It's great. Um, I came upon pretty much by chance um, and then 
finding windmills who were just in Dallas, which is you know, so close to me in Austin, I was amazed. I was practically jumping up and down. <laughs> I was like, they're in Texas. This is amazing. Um, and we've actually been to um, their tap room now. We haven't before I wrote this article. And oh my goodness, just chatting with RJ was such an absolute joy. Um, just hearing his story about how he he has a brewery in Dallas and um, a brewery in, brewery in Bangalore. So how his experience across um, both countries, both continents, uh, as um, a brewery um, head brewer and CEO, sorry, not head brewer, um, brewery owner and CEO and brewer um, in both, um, both locations is just absolutely fascinating. So finding them was, yeah, it felt, it felt really, really good. Convincing them that I was sort of a, a real writer was fun. Um, and then, but then as soon, as soon as I got them on board, again, they were just so, so, so keen to, um, to tell me what they were up to, um, what they loved about craft beer. They all had different stories with some similarities. Most of them had had very sort of extensive careers outside of beer before coming into beer. It um, apart from Ravi, I think it wasn't their first sort of first thing to do out of college per se. Um, so they brought so much um, different um, industry, different experiences, different life experiences, and also being from um, different parts of India, different ideas about flavor, um, into the beer world and it was the project was just yeah it was a real real joy to work on um i'm gonna pause and we'll we'll get to a question that was just shared in the chat and if you have a question as well to ask feel free we'll have a moment to chime in as well so this question um from uh, from jimmy is uh, beer has a long history of being tied to colonialism uh, what should we be looking for to help beer, especially craft beer, move beyond that history to reach out to marginalized folks, uh, women, people of color, et cetera? Um, that's a very, very good question. To go back to my Good Beer Hunting article, actually, one of the points that Amrita Kovac makes is exactly that, that beer has been sort of horribly colonized and that, that is why it has left it so open to sexism and racism. And I'll say what I said um, in the article, which is representation is key. It really, really is incredibly important, not just to say that you're a safe space, not just to say that you are an equal opportunity employer, an equal opportunity space. It's to actually go out, do you know, deliberately reach out to people, especially if you are a brewery who is um, taken over in a gentrified um, previously um, an area that has been previously inhabited by um, marginalized groups, people of color, and you've sort of brought in your brewery to actually deliberately reach out to the community that surrounds you, um, to employ people from different groups at all levels, not just in your tap room, not just as front of house, but to encourage people in an active way to really understand your beer and understand that there's a space for them in your brewery, in your tap room. Um, I think that all of those things are really, really crucial in terms of overcoming those barriers. Yeah, it, there are uh, a few things that immediately come to mind and which bring me back to a question that I think I'm poking at you, Ruvani, that I want to poke at a little bit more. One, um, so if you have read any of the Guild's recent newsletters uh, or visited a blog, you'll have seen that we are featuring Jeff Allworth's uh, diverse uh, brewery database which has a collection of hundreds of industry professionals who can talk to you about any topic, uh, making beer, selling beer, talking about beer, uh, front of house, back of house, the business of beer, whatever it may be. Uh, this, is an, this is an excellent way to diversify your Rolodex. Uh, and these are people who are well attuned and can talk about any topic not just diversity and equity in beer. Um, we've also been sharing links to uh, publications like NPR have created a diverse list of experts in a whole host of fields. So if you're looking to tell a story that involves exactly what Ruben is talking about, gentrification, uh, sociology, culture, you can go to these databases to find people who uh, are from typically underrepresented groups uh, in cover in media coverage 
to help diversify, enliven your storytelling and get to share important voices as well. Uh, and Ruvani, so you've been talking about the ability to find and connect with people over social media, which I think is also a really important tool that maybe we don't think about so much. We see things on Twitter, we see things on Facebook, and those often kind of, that's the end of that interaction where we might, you know, pull and cite that thing. Um, but there's that next step where we actually reach out, whether it's people on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, uh, Reddit has been a source for myself and others as well. How do you go uh, to find a stranger on social media who maybe shared something that kind of provoked uh, a great thought that you that connects to a story? How do you go from being strangers to talking on the phone or email? Um I absolutely will answer that, but I just want to go back to Jeff's um, database for a minute, as you mentioned it. Um, I've been assisting him with that in a, in a sort of, yeah, uh, small capacity. And I think it's so, so important that the work that he is doing on that. And I really, really encourage everyone to, in, um, to contribute to it, to contact him directly if you see um, any brewery with that who, who he has missed, who has anyone who falls into any of the categories um, that he has created, because it's absolutely essential data. Data is really, really, really important. Um, and it's a huge, huge gap in this industry that we do not have data broken down um, and cross-referenceable data about minorities in beer. And I can't, yeah, I can't emphasize enough um, the importance of, of what Jeff is up to. Um, I'm trying to help him out as much as I can, but it really is a collaborative effort. And I know that he will respond to, yeah, to any and all contributions and get them straight into the, into the database to make it as thorough as possible. So, yep, yeah, it's a, such, such a, a, an important, relevant and great resource. Um, but to go back to what, um, to what you were saying, Brian, sorry. Um, my, you know, I, I'm very straightforward. I will contact someone. I will say, oh, you, I, I see this about you. This, you know, I, I'm interested in this. And I think that that's what, um, what all um, writers, reporters, if you will, would do. Um, and say, I, I, I found you, your, your, your story is relevant to me for this reason. Um, I'd like to talk to you more. Sometimes people ignore you, they, they will. But that's, I mean, that's, you know, that, that, that will happen in, you know, that is not related specifically to any one story, um, any one person. You have to sort of be able to approach people in, and say, look, I, I'm interested in you. I'm interested in what you have to say. Um, and again, Showing empathy, it all comes back to, to showing empathy, I think. Yeah. Um, Kate had a question that she asked about whether pitching stories tied to your identity feels especially sensitive. Uh, she asked further, uh, do you feel more emotionally invested in the pitch? Is there fear of rejection scarier for that than with other stories? Um, yeah, probably, yep. <laughs> Uh, I think it's it's a very, very interesting question because the pieces that I have written where I have had um, a huge degree of emotional investment are certainly the pieces that I'm most sort of most proud of and and would if I would always choose those examples of my work if someone were to ask. Although I, when I've written, I don't even want to think how many pieces about beer now. Um, if people say, oh yeah, yeah sh 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 show me some examples of your work. I always go back to the ones that are personal. And I do think that, yeah, not more, even more than, than the fear of rejection, the fear of them not getting out there at all, the fear of those stories that, that means so much to me, never being seen or read is yeah it is is definitely yeah much deeper than if i'm sort of doing a brewery or a beer profile or uh, or, or something or, or someone else's story that's not sort of relevant to me and, and that's a that's a great part of what kate was also asking about too where she added on to that asking if that affects the way that you pitch and it sounds like that may at least in the what you're sharing with people when you pitch um yeah, I think certainly, well, 
it, 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 it's hard to say how my pictures are, are received and if that's what people pick up on, because aside from obviously the South Asian beer lady piece, I haven't necessarily always sort of talked about my own connection. For example, the Vine Peppies, I, I wasn't sort of saying I'm only writing this or I care about this specifically because I'm a South Asian too. I was like, I care about this. And my main reason for caring about it is because nobody has written about it, nobody. Um, I wrote a piece for um, a UK publication called Burham Collective recently about beer and class. And that was a very, very personal piece. It was very, very um, important for me to really, really get my very, uh, very, very deep feelings out in that piece. And I had a very, very sensitive um, editor who actually accepted it fully written, <laughs> which was great because I, I, I had written in this sort of like fit of emotion and poured it out. And she was like, yeah, we get this. Oh, thank goodness, because it was very, very, um, I, I felt I would have been so upset if, if people hadn't had the chance to, um, to, to just to, to, to take my take on it, whether they liked it or whether they did not like it, and not everybody liked it, <laughs> but I just really wanted to, to, to say it so much. Uh, so Liz and kind of she's chiming into something that we had briefly talked about before because um, and Liz was asking about uh, the South Asian brewers who were initially hesitant to share their story with you uh, and Liz asked do you think that a writer that didn't share a background with, uh, would have been able to build the trust that you ultimately were trying to bring to your story? Yes. Definitely. I think the main reason that they were sort of hesitant was that they were surprised that anyone was interested. <laughs> they, they, you, 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 you want to write, and are, are there enough of us? Is there enough of a story you want to write about us? I think it was, it was a sort of, yeah, oh, wow, really cool. More, more than, more than anything else. And also I think sort of be, being approached by, yeah, by someone they hadn't um, hadn't heard of, asking them to tell their story when you know, they're, they're brewers, they're, they're, they're not writers, they're not in that sort of part of the industry. They just, I think they just haven't considered it as something that, you know, that would be done. And I mean, I know that they they all, at least they've all told me that they were, um, they were really happy with it, which, yeah, which is fantastic. So um, I think that that's, yeah, that was, has been, it's been a great outcome for, for all of us. And there was a, a second part of what Liz was curious about, too, in terms of publications prioritizing um, stories about equity or diversity, diversity written by writers who might share those backgrounds. And Liz asked specifically, uh, what do you think is gained when a diverse writer covers a diverse subject versus when, say, a white writer tells that story? I think it's terribly, terribly important for writers from marginalized backgrounds to tell the stories of um, people from some, not just people from similar backgrounds and their own stories, but to actually be a part of the writing community. And I think that you cannot go, always have um, um, writers, oh, sorry, um, white, cis white male writers telling other people's stories because there is um, a lack of understanding um, that may, be pervasive and it may stop the story being as authentic as it could be otherwise. I mean, it's not a blanket issue. Every story is different, but I think that there has to be at least the option for people to tell their stories to writers from other marginalized backgrounds, even if it's not the same background. And I think that you know, it's writing is as important to be diverse as every other area of beer. As I said, um, I think that breweries need to encourage minorities, marginalized groups into every area, and that includes writing, um, which is not to say that um, you can't tell someone else's story, but sometimes you can't. <laughs> it really, it's okay. It's definitely a case by case, but I think that you have to, there has to be um, enough writers um, and enough representation in beer writing for what different voices to come across um, authentically and um, and with, with a shared understanding. This brings to mind a key point that was raised by uh, Claire Bullen uh, some time ago in our, we spoke with Claire and Chris O'Leary about travel writing, the way that relates to beer. And, 
Claire emphasized the need at Claire as an editor, emphasized and a writer who's been celebrated for travel writing, trying not to focus on the idea of helicopter journalism in those instances where you visit a, a city or a town or a place for, you know, three days. And then because that also greatly influences your own personal experiences in the world and your existence will impact how you see that place, which may not be the full and complete story. It sounds similar to what you're talking about here, that being able to understand those lived experiences helps to bring a story to life in ways that it might not otherwise. Yeah, yeah, I think that that's, yeah, that's a very, very good, good way of, of summing it up because ultimately, you know, as a writer, um, it's, it is exactly what you described. You, know, you're, you are helicoptering in to someone else's world if that's not your world. And sometimes that's okay. Sometimes you know, if, it, if it, it's, there are issues and there are topics and there are places and there are subjects where that's okay. And also that is a perspective. It's not necessarily um, an irrelevant perspective, but it may not be the perspective that the people whose stories you're telling want to be told. Do you think this kind of storytelling is the most important thing we can be doing right now? Um, <laughs> it's, hard, it's hard to say what the single most important thing we could be doing right now is, but I think it is very, very important. And I think that, again, you know, to, to, to go back to um, recent events in terms of the, um, the sexism in beer out, um, revelations that have been coming out, I think that that highlights exactly why it is important because uh, we, we don't want silence around issues of marginalization, issues of prejudice, issues of bigotry, issues of violence. Uh, we, if we really, really want to make beer inclusive, if we really, really want this to be an inclusive space, then we can't stop talking about it and we can't sort of you know, take our finger off the button just because some people might say, oh, hasn't there been enough on diversity? Well, there won't have been enough on diversity till we're not calling it diversity, if you see what I mean. <laughs> that's, uh, that's the goal here. Uh, I'm going to pause for a moment to ask if anybody would like to chime in and ask a question. Um, I think we might go for about 10, 15 more minutes. I certainly can continue asking questions, but if you are curious to ask something yourself, feel free to unmute and chime in. Otherwise, I will continue going. Uh, if you do have a question but don't want to chime in on video, you are welcome to post something in the chat box. I will happily play MC for you. Um, uh, Ruvini, so all of this actually leads to a very uh, meta point in that, like, so you and I, we, we talked about having this conversation focus on some of your more recent pieces that you've written, which have been about identity. Uh, but of course, this is not the entirety of your archive of writing. Uh, you've done a lot more. Uh, you also have a very uh, great presence on social media as well. So beyond these things that maybe have, you know, been front of mind for you over the last few months, what are some of the other stories that, uh, or moments in time, that you've enjoyed capturing as you've been covering the industry recently that, that stand out to you? Um, I was, I mean, I was absolutely delighted to have covered um, one of my favorite um, Central Texas breweries for Texas Highways, um, which is Wild Bunch Brewing out in Red Rock, um, at Texas. They have a very, very just beautiful and unique setup that is absolutely in the middle of nowhere. Um, all their beers are fire brewed. Um, they, the head brewer, um, co-owner, Yali Lillamon, he lives just off the site and he does everything himself. Um, he's a biochemist, but um, um, before he was a brewer and a distiller and his beer is just superb, but it's just also such a lovely place to hang out. We go there a lot, we spend time there with our friends and it's, it's just such a very, very special experience. It's also superbly Texan in a way that I love. And writing writing about him was just so much fun. You know, so we're, we're great friends with him as well. And I know that it, it, meant, it meant a lot to him to, to have, have that piece published about him. And it was just super, super lovely. It was also the first um, 
piece I had professionally commissioned, which meant that even though it was not the first that came out, um, it took quite a long time to actually come out, but that it, it means a great deal to me for that reason. And it, uh, that, that was a very, uh, very, very special thing to do. And also uh, my work for Beer is for Everyone is something that I'm really, really proud of, being part of their writer collective, um, working with their editor, Lindsay, who's just wonderful on so many um, really, really interesting and not always very easy to approach and not always very sort of, a lot of people would say not necessarily publishable topics because some of them are quite difficult. They are quite contentious. They're not necessarily what people may want to think about or read about when they're thinking about beer. And she's so good at bringing, you know, taking very sort of big cultural issues and um, letting me work with them, work around them and then sort of tie them back to, um, back to beer. Um, and just having that ongoing relationship with with her and with the um, the collective has been something that I really uh, really really love. Um, most recently, the piece I wrote for them about the problem with Asian and using Asian and Asia as a blanket term was something that has tied in closely with um, the other work that we've been talking about um, today. So I think those are those are definitely highlights. Can you? Go back to the Texas Highways piece. Um, one of the things that we've often talked about in some of these chats is finding ways for beer stories to exist outside of the beer ecosystem. And so I know you said that you were commissioned to write this, um, just to maybe help brainstorm for people to, to think about ways that that might be feasible for them. How did the story come to life in terms of telling the story for Texas Highways, which I had never heard of until I saw you post the story? Uh, well, um, most uh, in, in, in Texas, it's, yeah, it, it's pretty big news because they are very known for finding the small towns, the interesting stories, the, the cool businesses, the, the statues with tons of history, the best beaches. I mean, it's, it's a very, very cool publication. And when I sort of first visited Well Bunch and was sort of first thinking about writing about them, I thought, well, this is such a, a quintessentially super cool Texan secret. So I initially thought, yep, yeah, let's, let's share it with someone who specializes in super cool Texan secrets. Could you, could you connect those dots a little bit further? Because again, like I think uh, so much initially when we hear about cool stories is I need to find a beer publication that fits this story that I wanna tell. But I think both you in this example and others show that beer, sto beer related stories can exist elsewhere. So when, so you knew about Texas highways uh, so what was it that led to those dots being connected along the way? Um, as I said, I spent a fair bit of time at the brewery and was thinking sort of, oh, it's, it's not that people outside of Texas wouldn't be interested in it, but I really thought that it's, it's so special as a place and so much of what's special about it is the location, the landscape, the fire brewing, all of it sort of the way that it all comes together, the site, the site is so beautiful, the brew house is so beautiful um, and the flavours and the community that he's built um, from his local um, folks in Red Rock and then also now um, more widely uh, he's, he's uh, getting better known now people come from Austin he told me um, that um, he had some, a group in from Waco which is pretty far and he was so excited and I just think that that's yeah that's brilliant but I just thought, yeah, this is a, this is such a special sort of Texas thing. It's outside. It's not just, I mean, many, many small towns in Texas have breweries, but he isn't just, he's not in town. He's absolutely in the middle of nowhere. And you really get a sense of the land, of the landscape, of the climate. Um, and also just of, of you know, what it's what it's like to be in in the middle of Texas where nothing is is close, really. Uh, and it sounds like I don't know if I'm jumping beyond those dots that you just connected to, but a lot of states do have tourism magazines or something similar than for what you're talking about, Ruby. Um, and at a time when states as the country is opening back up and looking out into their publication schedules, I imagine 
finding unique stories to tell unique stories of the state that other people aren't keen to have a lot of resonance. And so whether it's, you know, the highways of Texas uh, or, you know, the cornfields of Kansas, I guess, like there's going to be something somewhere uh, that it doesn't have to be a beer publication yeah. to tell those stories. And, and working and one more behind the scenes question about that too. What was the interest? Why was it that telling a beer, a story from the beer world was something that got the folks at Texas Highways interested? Um, that's actually a very good question. And it's funny because when I sort of initially sent my pitch through, um, one of the first things that the editor said to me was, yes, yes, we, we have enough about how beautiful the landscape is here. And I, I, I was still relatively new to Texas. And I was just like, but to me, it's just still so exciting. You don't understand. But what she actually was very um, interested in and excited about was the fire brewing. Um, was the, I mean, I won't say unique because I know of other breweries that fire brew, but the unusualness of fire brewing, of fire brewing in Texas, of fire brewing in the middle of nowhere in Texas, um, and this sort of um, you know, centuries, centuries old tradition being kept alive by a um, Texan Norwegian in, yeah, in, in the sort of central Texas hinterland. That was what really appealed to her, was actually the process and, and what, what was special about that. Uh, I am going to do one last call for questions from the group, if you have any. Um, we are coming up in a, uh, on about an hour, so I want to be uh, aware of everyone's time. Um, if you've got a question, feel free to unmute yourself and ask away. We'll do it going once, going twice. Okay. Um, Ruveni, then, then we'll give you last word uh, with this. Um, for all of the things that you've shared with us tonight, I think there are common themes of ways that we should be more open to finding different stories, um, to finding different people that maybe we've talked to before, uh, in a very simplistic way, maybe just feeling more uncomfortable in what we have, the comfort zones that we've created. Um, what would you suggest for us to take away in terms of maybe thinking about those things to simply do better at our jobs? Um, from these stories that you've told, from the people that you've talked to, what is a good way that we might keep in mind the ways to, to feel uncomfortable to uncover some of these important things that you're talking about? Um, again, to go back to sort of the, the, almost the first point is I think that ex expressing and exhibiting um, empathy is absolutely crucial. Um, understanding that you may not always understand people. Sometimes you have to just accept them, believe them. Um, if you don't have enough in common, but accepting them and believing them for who they are, for what their experiences are and for how their experiences have been and how they differ from yours but also rooting out the things that you do have in common, not being afraid to be open, to share, to look for the, those points of connection. I think that those are all really, really um, important things. And also understanding that when people speak from a marginalized, um, le less included perspective, it's hard. It's often hard. It's, I mean, it's hard to talk about diversity from you know, if you've ex had a bad experience, it's hard to talk about diversity if you feel that you know you're a voice that has to keep on championing, championing it. You know, it gets exhausting, it gets tiring. You get fed up. You get fed up of oh of of always being the person that's banging on about diversity. But as I said, you know, we we won't have reached a point where it's okay to stop doing that until we stop talking about diversity because there is no need to. But when people want and are willing to tell their stories, just yeah, being as open and as empathetic as possible and finding points of connection wherever, wherever you can. Well, thank you uh, for focusing on these stories, bringing them to light and encouraging us to do the same. Uh, so appreciate your time, Ruvini. Thank you.